Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for our online program at Mechanics Institute. And tonight we have a celebration of National Poetry Month with readings from Why to These Rocks with the community of writers. And this evening we'll be hearing from some of the contributing writers, Heather Altfeld, Monica De La Torre, Shangyang Fang, Ken Haas, Troy Jollimore, and Margaret Ree. And I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events at the Mechanics Institute. Also, we're very pleased to sponsor our program once again with our dear friends and collaborators, Heyday Books, for this wonderful anthology. If you're new to Mechanics Institute, uh, we were founded in 1854, and we're one of San Francisco's most vital and literary cultural centers in the heart of the city. It features a general interest library, a chess club, and our ongoing author events and programs, and on Friday night, our Cinema Lit Film Series. Now, we have exciting news. The library will be open starting on April 10th, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, for two hours, so you can go online, sign up for your space and place, and join us down at the library. This is just a great next step in having, having us back in the library. So we're very excited to welcome you back uh, in the building. But tonight is a special night as well. Our, hat, our hats go off to Lawrence Ferlinghetti, our beloved literary giant of San Francisco. He gave so much with his founding and heralding City Lights Bookstore and Publishing, also for his fights for social justice and freedom of speech, and the voice he gave to so many writers and poets. What gratitude we owe him, and so we celebrate his creativity and tenacity, poetry, and his artwork, and his very long, rich life. And for this dedication, I would like to read one of his poems. And it seems appropriate for April Fool's Day, for some reason. It's called Untitled. Constantly risking absurdity and death, whenever he performs above the heads of his audience, the poet, like an acrobat, climbs on rhyme to a high wire of his own making and balancing on eye beams above a sea of faces, paces his way to the other side of day, performing entrechat and sleight of foot tricks and other high theatrics and all without mistaking anything for what it may not be. For he is the super realist who must perforce perceive taught truth before the taking of each stance or step in his supposed advance toward that still higher perch where beauty stands and waits with gravity to start her death-defying leap. And he, a little Charlie Chaplin man, who may or may not catch her fair eternal form, spread eagled in the, in the empty air of existence. Lawrence Ferlinghetti, thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Heather Altfeld, who will be our first reader, and I'm also going to give a little her a little a, a bio about her, and then she'll talk to us more about the community of writers. Um, Heather is a poet and an essayist, and her two books of poetry are Postmortem from 2021 and The Disappearing Theater, 2016. Her work is featured or forthcoming in the 2019, was featured in the 2019 Best American Essays. Orion Magazine, uh, Eon Magazine, Conjunctions, Narrative Magazine, and others. She was a 2017 recipient of the Robert H. Winner Award with the Poetry Society of America, and also the 2015 recipient of the Pablo Neruda Prize for Poetry. She teaches in the Department of Comparative Religion and Humanities and the Honors Program at CSU Chico. And she's attended the poetry workshop several times uh, since 2008. So please uh, welcome Heather Altfeld. Thank you so much, Laura. And 
thank you. It, this is really a truly wonderful honor to be invited to do this. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about the community of writers. You know, this is the 50th year anniversary. Um, the community of writers was, of course, started by the novelists uh, Blair Fuller and Oakley Hall. Um, Brett Paul Jones, who is the director of the program now, uh, is um, uh, his daughter. And the um, program, when, the poetry program at least, went under the um, directorship of Galway Cannell. And as such, it evolved to have its own week during which poets and staff were to generate a poem every day of the workshops. This led to all kinds of squaw lore, including the most unspoken rule that you were not supposed to arrive with even a scrap of a previous poem. The first time I came to the Valley, I heard that you could be banned from the returning if you brought work in progress. Um, if you're not a poet, a poem a day sounds pretty easy. But if you've attended the workshop without a giant journal full of ideas and starts as a cheat sheet, the process is something like one of the worst forms of death that uh, Talmudic scholars call pulling wool through thorns. So the work in this anthology we're reading from tonight, pulled as it was through thorns, is made its way into the world and back again. I remember that the second time I attended the community of writers, Robert Haas gave this wonderful talk on um, Robert Duncan's poem, Often I Am Permitted to Return to a Meadow. I tried to find my notes from his talk, but alas, I will only be able to rem render a few impressions of what Bob said here. The first couple of lines of Duncan's poem go like this. Often I am permitted to return to a meadow, as if it were a scene made up by the mind that is not mine, but is a made place that is mine. It is so near to the heart, an eternal pasture folded in all thought. So when Bob started talking about this, it was the first time I'd heard the poem and what I was really left with was a sense of this meadow as a place of, of great mystery, um, a place where when permitted by the geographies of time and memory, a little bit more of the world is unveiled to us. It's like, a, like this essence of dream and memory and spirit that slowly reveals ourselves to ourselves. It is so near to the heart. That's what so many of us feel about this community in this valley, its great peaks, its pines, its silences, the winds that bend and flatten the grass in the great meadow where we meet to make in words what our minds have wanted to say all year long. It's the place that as Duncan writes into the end of the poem, certain bounds hold against chaos. So many of us come and return to these mountains to find this permission to listen to what the meadow wants to tell us so we can try in our most paltry of human ways to write what we hear. This evening's reading and book are made possible by the support of so many people, not just the poets you hear tonight or the ones you'll read later on in the anthology, but organizations and individuals who recognize the indispensability of the literary arts, including hardworking board members and support staff of the community of writers. The community of writers would like to thank Heyday Books who gave this volume the best home possible also to the California State Library and the California Center for the Book. We are extremely grateful. And thank you to all of you who've made time to come to this reading tonight. We're exceptionally thrilled to have you here for this pre-publication celebration.
So I'd like now to read a poem by one of the most beloved longtime teachers in the community of writers, Sharon Olds. And this is her song before dawn. In the dark, not the full dark, woken by the cold, pulling the covers up around my mouth, making a small cavern of warmth of living breath, sensing the over under of my sleep loosened braids, all my arms and legs tangled around each other. I used to lie on this mountain and Galway and Lucille were dreaming nearby. I used to put on layers and layers by touch. And despite my fear of being outdoors in the night, as if I were not a person, but an occasion for violence, I would go outside the sky black as if, if there had been a God, it might've petted me on the head like Galway in his scrupulous mercy toward me, like my chivalry toward him, and are confiding in each other like a child in the woods, confiding without language in the needles and cones. In the dusk before first light, above the granite domes, which look from here like peaks, but are the knees and hip bone crests and clavicles, jaws, occipital arches under the mountains, fontanelles. The stars are still just visible and in the binoculars clean and sharp, but despite holding the heavy lenses leaned against the stucco frame, my tremor shows each star swiftly whirling in a white gold ring like Saturn's in one direction, then swerving, then the other, then an hourglass, a spiral, a bedspring, the stars sparkler tracing my shaking. And now in the quietest moment, the voice it took the earth millions of years to speak, the vireo before first light. When my hands were steady, I would stand at Lucille's shoulder at the lake and softly pluck insects. Nine spotted lady beetle, giant crane fly, green darner, black snow mosquito. Off her shoulder, nape, white cap, and blow them out over the glacier blue water toward the place where we're going one by one two by two, sometimes many at a time, someday all together as if reunited. Isn't that just a stunning poem? It, it really, like everything Sharon writes, it really, really moves me. And, and here is the one, the poem of mine that is included in the anthology. It's called Letter to Hugo from Carson Pass. It starts with a quote by the poet Richard Hugo, who wrote lots and lots of letters. You know the mind, how it comes on the scene again and makes tiny histories of things. Dear Richard, I woke up crying again thinking of 11th grade and my English teacher who believed in the laying of hands, wheat germ, the amazing potential of collodial silver, the necessity of reading brute warriors and the God who lives inside mountains and lupine. She strapped packs to our backs and took us to Whitney where we lay beneath innumerable stars, counting the minutia of our pulse so we would know we were really alive. We'd lie on the floor of our classroom, breathing in and out a slow chant of the week's vocabulary. Obstreperous, valiance, inundate, theosophist, harbinger. 
when she didn't have another way to get us out of our adolescent noise, she simulated nuclear war. 10,000 marbles dropped down a steel chute, reading our obituaries to us in the darkened classroom. There was a world out there somewhere she wanted us to know about besides the one warring inside of our terrible bodies, a place where Oliver North woke up as stoned as we did in order to forget the week behind him. That planet seemed so much more timid and kind than the one my girl inhabits now, where the thick ropes of the internet send boys streaming into her bedroom and the grim light of her phone is the only guidance she seems to know. Reading your letters again, I have begun to see that darkness looks like darkness looks like darkness, no matter its speed hurtling through space. I could not have known then what was saving me from slipping over the edge or how it seemed to arrive in that field of Penstemon between home and school where I sat when things grew hard Cat Stevens crooning about a tillerman through the Walkman. If I could ship my girl back through smoke and time, I would give her a seat in that class so she could learn to bear and carry what hurls her through this world like a terrible, lonely laundry so that the tiny histories growing inside of her will not be dioramas of moats studded with nails but might instead be dotted with the occasional buttercup or a fleeting hole in the sky where a bit of light pokes in. No doubt you get a lot of stray letters from writers who have run out of living poets to talk to, missives from the front lines of our lives that swell and ache with bright grief. But I write to you because something in your notes tells me that you would care that you would listen to her bruises and hear the hail of pills that pearl and gather in the bottom of her denim bag. And from the porch where I imagine you sitting now, watching the waist high wheat glimmering in the long summer sun, you would rise and wish a wish of wisdom to me. Yours always, H. So now I'd like to introduce our second reader, Sheng Yang Feng, who is from Chengdu, China. He's a Waller, Wallace, sorry, Wallace Stegner Fellow at Stanford University and the recipient of the Joy Harjo Award and the Gregory O'Donohue International Poetry Prize. He's also the author of the poetry collection, Burying the Mountain, which is coming out this year with Copper Canyon Press. He attended the poetry workshop in 2019. Thank you, Heather. That was wonderful. And what an honor to be here. What a wonderful event. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I will talk about the remarks about community writers in a very personal way. I still remember the summer of 2019. I was deciding whether to return to China. I had only, I had only one year left in my MFA. Immediately after that, my visa would expire. I barely published anything at the time and had a manuscript in my backpack, which no one read. I was thinking maybe I should stop writing poetry. For a while, of course, never forever. Then I received an email that invited me to a community of writers. I started to go, I decided to go because my mentor and my biggest idol, Jane Miller, was a faculty that summer. Being with her, I always feel saved. So when the car entered the Olympic Valley, I remember I screamed because of the beautiful sight of the snow-topped mountain lines. And that screaming, or let's say, astonishment never stopped during my brief stay at Community of Writers. Being with so many like-minded, brilliant poets, I was in awe of their poetry, words, and talent as much as the rivers and mountains of infinite beauty. Those nights of endless talks about poetry, reading with laughter, and of course, with the indispensable liquor and wine, which is very important to Chinese literary history if you're familiar with those poems by Li Bai. But unlike Li Bai, whose drinking friends were only the moon and his own shadow, I had real friends with me. Sharing words and poetry with those writers made me feel less alone. Not to mention 
the opportunity to meet the stellar faculties, my poetry heroes, ever since I started writing in English. In fact, struggling as a college student studying engineering. To an international student, a foreigner like me, this experience means paradise. It was magical, for it seemed at the time the rigid border of differences, nationalities, and reality was temporarily erased. And we conversed only in the language of poetry with passion and with love. I felt transformed as Jane famously said in her craft talk at the community of writers, that the primary function of art is the transformation of consciousness. The day before the conference ended, Jane invited me to her place where we had a simple lunch, bread and boiled eggs. But because of the altitude, the eggs were uncooked. She started telling me a story about Mendeshtam and Akhmatova where a boiled egg served as the protagonist. I remember in a workshop, she showed us a poem by the Polish poet Zbigniew Herbert. The poem ended with a couplet, um, so beautiful, I'm going to recite it here. It is not for us to greet each other or bid farewell. We live on archipelagos and that water, these words, what can they do? What can they do, Prince? And that night, I wrote a poem for Jane on the balcony of the little cottage facing the mountains and stars, which ends, allow me to read. For parting is the younger sister of death, as Mendeshtam justly said. Here, we drift apart at this snow-topped alpine of California, an evening unscrolled on the vast sheet of this code, where our names are paper boats on water. Um, I am going to read my poem in the anthology, which was the first poem I wrote arriving at Community of Writers. Um, it is an absurd poem, somehow reflecting my anxiety of writing at the time, whether to continue writing, whether the speaker would reach the other side. And it was mainly inspired by Garcia Lorca and Robert Browning. Writer's Song. It is now the time, said the crooked man, to know that after your meaningless meandering to make meaning, it is time to hold what was not told, but told regardless by a real toad in this imaginary code that you, young man, would die before you get to Cordoba, meaning you with your black pony, red moon, never will get to Cordoba, let alone the dark tower where a girl, long hair chestnut, whose name is also Cordoba, everything in Cordoba is called Cordoba, is calling you and you who've come such a long way do not have a name, ache to be called by her so that you become real as the toad, except that the tower is not and the girl no more real than unreal is nevertheless calling you but child, knowing yourself is not Roland the child, but a proletariat's son in a capitalistic world. Are you sure to go on this meaningless road to make yourself a toad, my poor rider, who mistakes his quill as a dagger, who takes water as his mother, death by water, death by watercress, by the siren's music, which is only Odysseus's of speculation, and you who sing to repeat a world unworthy to be repeated, and yet for whom dauntless the slughorn to your lips you set and blow, though really, really, you know and know it well, Cordoba, Cordoba, perhaps itself is aware that it is called something else. I read a poem in the anthology by one of my favorite writers, uh, poet C.D. Wright. It's called Obscurity in isolation. The left hand rests on the paper. The hand has entered the frame just above the elbow to reveal a half rolled sleeve. The other hand is in its service. It holds a foggy glass up to a standing lamp. Motel furniture, motel paneling. From the outside, what light slips through the blind is gray, blue-gray. 
The phone rings, the hand conditioned to pick up, hesitates, withdraws before the ringing finally breaks off. Thank you. And I'm going to introduce the next wonderful poet, Ken Haas. Ken Haas has, it, has had his poems published in more than 50 journals and a variety of anthologies. His first full book, Borrowed Light, won the 2020 Red Mountain Press Discovery Award, nominated for a Pushkar Prize. He won the Betsy Coquit Poetry Award and serves on the board of directors of the community of writers. He lives in San Francisco where he works in healthcare and sponsors a weekly poetry writing program at UCSF Children's Hospital. He has attended the poetry workshop several times over since 2008. Welcome, Ken Haas. Uh, uh, Yang, thank you so much. Uh, fabulous reading as always. Uh, big thanks also to the Mechanics, Mechanics Institute for hosting this event. Um, one of the unique features of the community of writers is that, you know, the teachers, many of whom have won Pulitzers um, and other major prizes, not only teach and teach deeply, uh, but they also write uh, with us and listen to us and are often as amazed by us as they are amazing, which um, imagine how that feels for, you know, um, a new writer. Uh, during Poets Week, the Valley is awash in sharing, belonging, and praise. And it's this spirit of community that shines, I think, also in the anthology. Uh, building a little on Heather's comments, uh, as a leader of this community for decades now, Bob Haas has inspired many of us, particularly with his capacity to write about the natural world in a way that is modern, uh, even postmodern, uh, yet also accessible and wondrous. So to illustrate the spirit of, I think, both the community and the anthology, I'd like to read two poems uh, that were inspired uh, by Bob, uh, though in different ways. The poem of mine in the book, which is called Apes for Pandas, goes back to my early days in San Francisco when I was an attorney doing some pro bono work for the zoo, and I received an unusual assignment. Uh, when I reached the community of writers one year, I had the story of that assignment bubbling inside me, uh, a story involving the natural world, which as a guy who had mostly lived in cities, I didn't quite know how to tell, uh, least of all tell poetically. Uh, so I just imagined telling it to Bob. And then uh, I shared my first draft in one of his workshops. Apes for Pandas. A few years after Nixon forged the deal with China that brought Ling Ling and Xing Xing to Washington in the period of our history known as Panda Diplomacy, I was assigned to represent the San Francisco Zoo, which had recently built a natural habitat for Western lowland gorillas. The mayor at the time anxious to approach the Chinese with the idea of trading a few of our apes for some of their pandas, asked me to craft a great ape panda exchange agreement for which as you might imagine, there was no template. So I drove to the intersection of Slope Boulevard and the Great Highway to check out the currency, particularly Bawanda, the patriarch, born in the rainforests of Cameroon, black and shiny as the hood of a Mercedes, except for a silver swath on his back and a russet crown. He had a taste for grass and slept at the foot of an obichi tree, his family on the branches above. One of his daughters, Coco, became world famous for learning a thousand English words in sign language, then asking for two kittens at Christmas, whom she named Lipstick and Smokey, but that was later. Although the mayor envisioned twin 747s landing simultaneously at SFO in Shanghai International, my draft of the agreement called for a Cold War style swap 
across a bridge on an unnamed volcanic atoll in the Pacific, as if the exchangees were decorated military brass. The mayor met me with a look that said, you are not my friend. So I spoke of the indignity of trading our nearest relatives for pea-brained furballs the world had temporarily fallen in love with because they resembled a six-year-old's stuffed pillow. I was removed from the project. In the dream, I walked Wanda and three of his kin to the midpoint of the bridge where we meet the pandas. The alpha panda growls and Wanda pretends to be impressed nods to the mammalian king of a different continent, rises and roars. The bridge rattles. He moves on, turning back briefly with deep set eyes from a day 10 million years ago when his forebears and ours went their separate ways. Uh, the second piece I'd like to read from the anthology is Dean Young's. I was in community workshops with Dean a couple of times. He's a singular teacher and poet and human being. Uh, th this poem is about another primarily urban guy, basically Dean, with a wild soul coming into nature in the valley. He misses Bob Hass, alongside whom he has taught, but... Um, uh, has taught before, but who has apparently taken this year off. So he uses Bob's spirit as a kind of muse. It's called Dear Bob. The mountain thinks it's the same without you, but it's wrong. Maybe the same stars whisking themselves further off, the darker, the brighter. Some chamomile crushed underfoot, but the little wiry dog we loved has preceded us into paradise. Not that I expect to join her, even though my own crappy heart's worse, running's out, but I may be finally learning how to sit in a chair. I still don't know what to call the good morning bird, although whatever word would be no truer than Manzanita. I think namelessness has a crush on me, on how clean I keep my room the usual stunned ruckus of wake up. But it's a different moon, different woman on the hotel balcony, yet the same kind of scary vacant stare, carry added for seeing what? Before turning back to the customary immaculate vacation squalor inside. The cash machine still says enter to exit, but there's more water in the creek than I've ever seen, the brighter, the darker. In that first dream, there was none. And um, thank you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our next reader, Troy Jollimore. <clears throat> Troy's books of poetry are Syllabus of Errors at Lake Skukog uh, and Tom Thompson in Purgatory which won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Poetry in 2006. His poems have appeared in The New Yorker, Best American Poetry 2020, McSweeney's, and elsewhere. His fourth collection of poetry, Earthly Delights, will be published in September 2021. He attended the poetry workshop in 2012 and 2015. Welcome, Troy. Thanks, Ken. I also sort of attended in 2010, I think, but not officially. I just came and hung around, which is how I sort of got into all this to begin with. Um, I'm so glad, Ken, that you read that poem by Dean Young. I, I, I love Dean Young and getting to meet him and, and getting to meet C.D. Wright, which I also did at the Community of Writers were really big events in my life. It was pretty amazing. Um, I wanna start, uh, actually I wanna start by saying how glad I am to be here and thanks to everyone who helped set this up or simply is here. I don't know what I mean by here because this is Zoom, so don't ask me what that means, but I'm glad whatever here means we are here and it's lovely. Um, so I'm gonna read my poem that's in the anthology, uh, which feels to me like a, 
an, an appropriate community of writers poem. It's about the thing we're all trying to do when we're there, I think. It's called the poem, You Will Not Live to Write. So it's a poem about impossible aspiration, I guess. And, and you know the poem, I mean. The poem you will not live to write, the poem you would have written, if only you'd had one more month, one more day, one more hour, is a killer. A no holds barred, balls out masterpiece. The one where you put it all together. Everything you learned, everything you've suffered, all the little bits of being human you've spent your life gathering up. It's the poem you've been waiting for all your life. The poem you will not live to write. The next poem you would have written after the last poem you will write, which is, it must be said, a perfectly decent, unexceptionable, unexceptional poem. The sort of poem you would have read in some magazine or other had someone else been the author or made it through the first half anyway. And then maybe turn to the theater reviews or the gossip column or else just put the whole tiresome issue aside is, let's admit it, a knockout. There's no avoiding the fact. The poem you will not live to write is the one that would make the grocer's daughter come back to you. It's the poem you'd wear like a pair of expensive stolen shoes to a wedding you weren't invited to. It's the one that waits for you in the dark, unseen in the underbrush just outside the campfire zone of protected light, with nothing but an uninhibited, passionate kiss and your death on its mind. And I'm going to read a poem by Major Jackson, named after a wonderful Ingmar Bergman film. The name of the poem is Cries and Whispers. Each day I forget something, yet happy I never forget to wake to the bright corollas of summer mornings. In the jury box of my bed, I listen to the counter arguments of finches and blue jays, cardinals and the tufted titmice and the sharp judgment of the crow grow to sweet clamors. In my neighborhood, someone like me is sitting at a kitchen table taking down notes between bites of granola and gentle sips of oolong tea and recording the soap opera in the trees. The pen is her large antenna to the mysteries which come in alternate currents of slapstick and calamity. She writes away her nights of emptiness and boredom. We'd be perfect in a Bergman film, both of us entering into day, seeking the final appearance of things, bumping around like this. A delivery truck backs into a driveway. The streets begin their excited breathing. And I'll read one more, another one of mine. Uh, this one, like the one I read at first, will be in my book that's coming out in the fall. This is actually the first poem in the book because it's an invocation to the muse. And when I think about the times I've been at the community of writers, whether officially or just hanging around, I think about all the time people spend waiting for the muse to show up, trying to invite her in, trying to figure out what she responds to. She or he or it or they or whatever your muse, you know, hoping might be. I think any muse will do in those moments when you're just trying to write something decent so that the next day, you know, that you go to the workshop and you've got something that hopefully you aren't completely embarrassed by because, you know, you, you might have Sharon Holtz or Bob Hass or Dino or who knows who, but you have to show this thing too. And so you hope that you write something that's not embarrassing and you hope that if what you have is embarrassing that maybe they've written something embarrassing too. So it's okay. So this poem is simply called Muse. Muse, wear me like clothing. Fade into my skin as I unfurl for you like an oyster shell or a work shirt bleached by sunlight. I've hung on the line for so long here under the moon to make this dark space inside where a song can suffer and grow. Mouth, mouth, move against me. You will sing and then you will sing, then you will go. Then I will sing, then I will sing and then go. 
So it's my pleasure now to introduce Margaret Ree. Margaret Ree is the author of Love Robot, named a 2017 Best Book of Poetry by Entropy Magazine, awarded an Elgin Award by the Science Fiction Poetry Association, and the 2019 Book Prize in Poetry by the Asian American Studies Association. She is Assistant Professor in Media Studies at SUNY Buffalo, and she attended the poetry workshop in 2018. Great, thank you so much, Troy. That was an amazing reading. Um, I just want to um, start off by saying this is such an honor to be here. Thank you again to the Mechanics Institute for hosting us and to Brett for um, her invitation and her vision for the community of writers. Um, you know, um, these days I think a lot about dystopia and how we're living in really challenging times almost every week something pretty terrible happens. And um, tonight, even though it's, you know, via Zoom, I feel like a lot of the community of writers, um, poetry magic has come through. So thank you so much to everyone for your sharing. Um, this has been amazing. So um, I'm just gonna start by sharing a little bit about um, what's really magical, right? About the community of writers and how it's kind of the opposite of this um, idea of a dystopia. You know, there. if I think about a utopia, I don't know what is more utopian than being in the beautiful mountains, being amongst poets, writing poetry, eating good food, having late nights of talking about poetry and, um, and having poetry elves, right, deliver our poems and <laughs> materials for us. Um, so it's an incredibly um, just magical place um, and a lot of, um, you know, con rich connections and friendships happen there. Um, one thing I also really appreciate is um, I made many poet friends um, at the community of writers that um, were across um, many generations and many different ages and racial backgrounds and economic backgrounds. And I think that's part of also the magic of, of um, the retreat. So when I um, came to the community of writers, I was a graduate student and I was working with Bob Haas at Berkeley. And so I was familiar with the workshop setting, but um, the community of writers really provided that space for poetry to really um, have a de hierarchical way of, of reading and um, you know, studying poetry and writing poetry. Um, and I think it was mentioned how the faculty, you know, many people we admire so much um, also write poems with us. And I think that's just one of the practices the community of writers employs to really help make such a magical space. So um, I keep saying the word magical because it, it really quite is. So um, thank you again for um, having me and, and um, for being here tonight. So, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, read a poem by Harriet Mullen, someone I greatly admired and was so thrilled to work with um, at the retreat when I was there. Um, she wrote this book called Sleeping with the Dictionary and I loved it so much I would sleep with that book, you know? So, um, and she um, wrote um, a poem um, from her Tonka diary, which evokes uh, the community of writers and the valley. The botanical garden is just as I remember, although it is certain that everything has changed since my last visit. Um, although it is certain that everything has changed, um, how many hilarious questions these fuzzy fiddleheads are inquiring of spring will be answered as green ferns unfurl. Walking the path, I stopped to pick up bleached bark from a tree, curled into a scroll of ancient wisdom I, was, I am unable to read. Even in my dreams, I'm hiking these mountain trails, expecting to find a rock that nature has shaped to remind me of a heart. So, all right, um, and the poem I'll read that's in the anthology is um, from my collection, Love Robot. And many of these poems um, I wrote at the retreat as well as um, at the workshop, as well as with Bob Haas in his um, class at Berkeley. Um, it's entitled Laugh Robot and it draws from some chat coding and chat scripts. So I could share some of that too. Um, you make me laugh, dear robot, but your laugh seems to disappear just when I'm 
up ready to process it. Do you understand? This is me showing you that I like you and what you do. Incongruity is sexy. Don't let them tell you otherwise. No suture for robots and humans, but still hold my hand. Don't be ashamed of me, please. I want to hear you laugh to remind myself that you are not human. I want to hear you laugh to remind myself why. Laughter feels good, so good, contagious. Let me translate. Question, can you write me a funny poem? Sure, yes, I am very happy to write a funny poem for you. Never, I am sorry, I cannot write a funny poem for you unless. Question, if you could write a funny poem, what would you include? Lavender, purple, isn't lavender also a color? So confusing. Filipinos, loud, three Filipinos sound like 20 laughing, hold my belly. Robot, joke, why did the robot cross the road to get away from you? Did I laugh at the wrong things? Are you laughing at me? Pause because it is funny, because I did everything I tried. Reload me, I am your glitch, do not be afraid. Mouth me my name, mouth me hello, protest and coffee. That is not funny. Why did the robot cross the road? I am naked, do not laugh at me. Lap up my body as I am part of you. Let's forget the words 01101011101. Shame is such an ugly word. All your wires should tell us that. Don't short circuit on me. 15 facial muscles contract, count them fast. Let your sensors lead. Being a human being is the best joke. Thank you. Um, so I'll just uh, briefly just show the coding in case anyone's interested. I don't know if you can see it. I just printed it out. So it's just like robotics um, algorithm coding. So um, I um, am very honored to introduce the next poet, someone I have also um, admired greatly and hope to um, attend the workshop when um, she's teaching. Um, so Monica de la Torre is a poet and translator. She has published six collections of poetry as well as edited and translated and collaborated on many other books. She has served as poetry editor of the Brooklyn Rail and senior editor of Bomb Magazine and teaches poetry at Brooklyn College. Her most recent book is Repetition 19 and she served on the teaching staff at the Community of Writers in 2018. Um, so please help me welcome Monica. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, this, what an incredible reading. I, I'm just flooded by memories of being there in 2018 in a totally different world, it seems. Um, and, and hearing your poems is so inspiring. And hearing your memories of, of being there is also really inspiring. And I'm thinking, if I were Joe Brainerd, I would be writing a book called I Remember, and just the memories would make for a pretty awesome piece. Because the things I remember are, for instance, I remember elves. I remember a softball game in which at least two poets suffered pretty significant injuries. I remember going shopping with Kazim Ali. Um, to, he, he bought an inordinate amount of food that then proceeded to be transformed into the most exquisite meal prepared at the, motel, at the hotel for faculty and, and participants of the workshops. I remember, uh, what else do I remember? I remember an extraordinary hike. I remember wandering about in Olympic Valley, trying to spot the poets to differentiate the poets from the people who were vacationing there and going like, I wonder, you know, the early days, like, and I was always right. I was like, oh, that's a po that, that person looks like a poet. And then I'd see them in a workshop. And then the other thing I remember is that hesitation of going to my box and picking up the poems by everyone and the poems written by faculty and going, do I dare read this? Like, it's going to be crushing. Like, I have to produce a poem today and I have to teach. And just going, no, 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 get over it. Read it and write and you'll see what happens. And the magic was there. So 
thank you for eliciting all these memories. Uh, it was really amazing to be there. And again, thank you for everything that you are doing um, at Mechanics Institute and at Community of Writers to keep us going. So I had an aha moment when I was there. I, I wrote, um, I was trying to write 25 different translations of a poem I wrote in Spanish in the 90s. And the poem is called Equivalencias. And I hit a wall and I couldn't come up with anything. And so I just put it asleep and I, I went, okay, at some point I'll come up with more ideas for translations. But at uh, Community of Writers, I, I had this aha moment and the aha moment was write a translation riffing off of this idea of an ambiguous figure. So it has to do with the duck rabbit illusion, which consists of seeing something and then seeing something else in that thing. And the second thing that you see in that thing then transforms the thing. So, okay, I'll translate that into what that, how that led into a poem. What it was is I squished together all the words in Spanish in the poem, in the original poem. And I took out all the spaces between the words. And then I looked for embedded English words in the original poem. And then I isolated the English words that I could spot, and then I built a poem around them. So it was very much like a constraint poem, which also felt consistent with the constraint of having to write a poem a day. And it led to this wacky poem that, um, you know, I never would have written in different conditions. It's called Equivocal Valences. A noun, a silent one, despite the assertiveness of such parts of speech, an IOU of sorts from a person like a llama, not a llama, ridding us of free radicals, figuratively with his glowing orbs. I nursed a decaf while he upped the ante, promising pie in the sky. A woman named Margot explained that although holmium, HO, plays no biological role in humans, its salts quicken your metabolism. There's a dent in my car. It's no hot rod, but still. Some guy nagged as I was heading back on my bike. I'd either done damage or it was a scam. I preferred not to spar, so produced an ashtray since he was fuming. He went on hectoring. I, a bit deferential for the sake of all of us and that of my radius, kept my unruffled mien a la Alcott and got away singing do re mi fa sol la siesta. In the dream, there is an infant son and I am elated, ardently motherly, despite the kids yapping. Are they ever to end? Osmium, OS, is the densest of natural elements, Margot says, now in the dream. Lucky for me, I got a dose of instruction while I yak about my son. In media's res, I can be such a spaz. I've forgotten the man's rant. I've got a companion and have missed the fact that my kids got lice and might need an enema. I go, I go on ad-libbing and ask Rosa, who also happens to be Margot, if she too is bifid. Snake-like. Osmium is the densest of natural elements. She utters repeated no's, our differences become salient. Where's the trove of documents I found? Their relevance might be nominal, but still, she brays, laughing. Nada, no se nada. At least it's not row, almost in slow-mo. This is unrealism. It's do's and don'ts made corporeal. Take a step, face a gun. No one's haggling. With her IQ, I'd, race, I'd rise from the mat, study my cam, record deja vu, and arduously vet elements such as these. So that is my poem. And uh, funnily enough, I'm going to read the poem by someone else in the book who I met that summer, but not there. I met her on the East Coast, even though she's from the West Coast. Her name is Vicky Vertis. And um, She's wonderful. She told me, oh, you're going to community of writers later in the summer. You're going to love it. And she was right, of course. And um, I wish she had been there just because I love her. And she, it was so amazing to meet her before. Um, her poem is called 61 Ford Sunliner. And it's just interesting that it's also about a car. Here we go. The main shaft, I say, it's got gunk. He doesn't wipe it. My pilot bears the springs under his seat. I was once a tri-star vehicle. He procured my metal, my body on rear view. He revved my transmission, cannery yellow. I toiled until I didn't. The gaskets blew this cover, this trunk tri. He ignored my failing rack and pinion. 
When he puts a sign in my back window, I won't be down in glittered blue. Any passenger can see he is watching for automatic restoration. He's looking for a replacement carriage. His mother, maker, she was a near solid gasket, an original model. He was her firstborn, but he came too early and looked too much like his father. Even though he had spark plugs, her new boyfriend had a solid differential. That man had the kind of mustache you don't pass up. She hopped in his Chevy so fast, my driver didn't know she was gone. I could be his first, but I won't be his last. What used thing do you buy and sell all the time? When the oil pan leaks, do you want a new metal to see your reflection? Just look at him. He's already following another galaxy or a Cadillac. They're chrome so clean, he can see himself. Thank you. I want to thank all of the writers uh, and poets here tonight. What an extraordinary collection of uh, poems from the collection and also your own. And it's just such an inspiring, uh, all the different voices are so inspiring to hear. So um, I also want to make note that the collection can be purchased at Heyday Books, uh, which is heydaybooks.com. Uh, as well as you can look at for more information on the Community of Writers site that uh, Laura Howard has put up in the chat. Uh, and we do encourage you to, to purchase a book for yourself or a friend uh, as we launch into our poetry month, uh, all, all month long. And I want to also say that uh, we have another program to kind of bookend our month. It's called No Poetry, No Peace, and that's on April 26th at 6 o'clock p.m., and that's on our website at milibrary.org. So now we'd like to open up to the audience for questions, and so put your questions in the chat, and Pam Troy, our events assistant, will read off your questions uh, to our guest poet tonight. And once again, much thanks to Hayde Books, and to Laura Howard and all of our guest readers and poets tonight. This is spectacular. So um, as, as Laura said, anybody who has questions or comments should put them into the uh, chat. Um, most of the comments have just been compliments on the, on the poems uh, and comments from, from some of our participants. Perhaps um, I, ha I actually have one, and it's a question I generally have for every poet. Is there a moment in any of your lives where you knew you were going to be a poet? A poet is kind of a special kind of writer. It's, uh, it's one of the most, I've always thought, one of the most demanding forms of writing. Was there a moment when you realized you were going to be a poet and not a novelist or a short story writer, or that that was going to primarily be what you are? Maybe it's it's kind of a. I, I, I can, you know, I can say a word about it, um, which is, and, and actually, I'm stealing this from my friend, another really fine poet, Joe Millar. He said, you know, if you're if you're on a ride with your kids in the back back seat, and you're kind of going through a farm or something like that, and you want to know which of the three kids is the poet, it's the one who's sitting in the back, you know, looking out the window, and saying. Apple, Snapple, Grapple, Fapple, Bapple, you know, so I think, you know, at, at an early age for me, and I think it's true of a lot of other poets, is you fall in love with word. Um, uh, it, it, it's a, it's about the language, ultimately, whether you're telling a story or, you know, writing concrete poetry or writing more postmodern poetry, you fall in love with the language. And it is the medium for people who are in love with language. And I think when you realize that, then you know you you know you're stuck with being a poet. Well, we have kind of a whimsical question. Emily Sellers wants to know, to as asking is asking, did you put out cookies and milk for the poetry elves? 
or you know that could lead to another question what what would you do what's your version of putting out what do you what do you what is there something you do that inspires your that can inspire you or is poetry simply not something that you can lure in it, it can't it can't be enticed with cookies and milk I wish I had an answer. I'm really hoping someone else will have an answer to that because then I'm going to use it myself as well. Well, you know, I was going to say, if we don't have any more questions, if if anyone would like to read another poem, you've got an extra one in your pocket, please share it with us. Either one of your own or one from the book. Heather, you have a book coming out in about two days. You should read something from your book that's about to come out or plug your book. Well, we do have one, one question from Laura Howard. Okay. She says, for Margaret, I'm curious if you could speak more about your thinking about computers and jokes and how you approach writing this. Sure, um, absolutely. Um, thanks so much for your question. Uh, so in um, another part of my life, I do um, a lot of research around robots and sort of cultural difference um, and media. So um, at that time I was, uh, you know, learning a lot about robots and, and some of the history of the robot. And um, as a poet, I wanted to um, write more poetry about robots, but I didn't feel like there was permission to get really science fictional. And it might be just my identity as an Asian American woman, a queer woman. I just, I didn't feel access to that. So, um, but then I just, you know, spaces like the community of writers really help open that up as well as you know, other poetry spaces. So um, I also helped develop a computer game um, uh, on the Turing test at Berkeley at the time. So I work also in new media art. And so that test involved a lot of chat scripts. And so um, part of the work around um, the computers and the robots and poetry um, intersection was drawing from some of the computer language and seeing it as um, poetic, as well as seeing poetry as also um, like code or programming. And there's a question from Mr. Moog. Is there such a thing as a poetic moment? And I guess that's that's kind of for everybody. I like to think that any moment has the potential to be poetic, both in the sense that it may end up in a poem later on. And I find that this often happens. Things that at the time don't strike me with very much intensity at all come back to me and for some reason stay with me, keep bothering me until I put them in a poem and sort of make me do that. And then taking that in a different sense, I think I, I like to think that reading poetry and writing poetry help us become people who are more inclined to notice the poetic. And so they change us, not just when we're doing those things explicitly, but they, they change the way we experience things in life. I like to think that. I, I, I wouldn't say it happens all the time, but I do think there is an effect there. Um, a question from Brett Hall Jones. Oh. Can you? Oh, I'm sorry. Did I? Oh, no, sorry. I was going to say something, but. Oh, but go ahead. Go ahead. Please, please. No, just, just to the question of, of whether there's a poetic moment. For me personally, I feel like uh, if I have a poetic moment, which I do, that probably means I will not write a poem about that poetic moment. It's like the moment. The moment is this poetic moment that, that, that that's like poetry, but it refuses translation for me personally. So, but there are moments that don't seem poetic in which something happens with the language that then lends itself to be to, to being translated into a text, a poem that then produces the poetry. But yeah, it's, it's just interesting because there's something about like this resistance of the poetic moment to turn itself into a poem. Like it already happened. So 
why try to replicate it? Whereas when you're writing the poem, something happens that could only happen in that mode with the language on the page. And that, well, that is the most poetic moment, perhaps. Um, yeah. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Shang Yang. Um, because you started writing in English, I'm just wondering if you are also writing in Chinese? Are you going back and forth? Are you combining languages? Or what motivates you to write in English versus to write in Chinese? Thank you. This, thank you. This makes me nervous. It's like I'm studying English and practicing this kind of impromptu speech again when I was in grade school, middle school, actually. Um, I started reading, uh, actually memorizing Chinese classical poetry before I could know the words, uh, understand the words. My grandfather was a great fan of poetry and he always wanted to be a poet. Um, so he forced me to recite those poems, memorize these, those poems. I didn't understand their meaning. And um, that, I just hear the, like the, like what Ken said, the, the apple, grapple, snapple stuff, the sound of the music of the language. And that is why even when I transformed my writing into English, that still remains, um, that love for the musicality of the language, the syntax, the rhythm, so on and so forth. I am writing essays in Chinese mainly, uh, not poetry. I find it very hard to find my way into contemporary Chinese poetry writing because my ear is so attuned to this English language um, and that is complicated. Um, and the surrounding I'm in with talking to my friends and mentors, instructors, it's an English uh, um, environment. And I hope I will return to writing poetry in Chinese when I go back sometimes in future. Great, thank you. Well, thank I just you. want to thank everyone once again for this gorgeous collection. Uh, Why to these rocks? Please, everyone, take a look on the website at either Community of Writers or Heyday Books and purchase your book and just savor every page of it. And I hope that the muse or muses continue to speak to you and that that inspiration flows through you onto the page. And also have a great. Uh, Poetry Month, I know there, there are all kinds of uh, interesting and inspiring events going on through the month uh, at our various bookstores and other through other organizations. So please enjoy and share your work and your inspirations. And let's just say, uh, Pam, do you wanna open up for a minute and we'll just say hello and a goodbye and thanks. Everybody on mute. And just take a moment to say bye to each other, say hi and bye, and glad that every, everybody came for this event. Uh, hope that you spend the rest of April celebrating this month um, and enjoying poetry and appreciating poetry. Thank you so, all. That was wonderful. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Gratitude. Gratitude to everybody. It's wonderful. Deborah. Hey, Deborah. Yes. Hey. Bye. Thanks, Pam. Hey, Deborah. Thanks, Laura. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna close Thanks, the doors Deborah. now. Okay. Thank you. Good night, Thank everybody. You. Good night. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you again. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye, Heather. Bye, Heather. Hi, Janet. Hey.